Before we start scanning, it would be good to know our objectives for scanning. What information do we need? What characteristics of systems are helpful to find? Let's explore some of the information we will need. Our first objective in scanning the network is to find systems. For our definition, we want to know about any system connected to the network that is within our scope of the project. When working with a customer before the project starts, we need to identify specific systems or network ranges that are part of the investigation and are targets for information gathering. This scope may be very specific, defining targets down to their IP addresses, or they could be very vague. For example, you may have just the company's name or domain name. The closer you are to the target, the fewer restrictions there are to impede your discovery. If you're scanning from across the internet, you'll encounter router ackles, firewall rules, intrusion prevention systems, load balancers, and traffic shaping along the path. These systems restrict access or limit the information you can gather. If we are operating from inside the organization's network, then there are likely fewer restrictions on access. If you're on the same local network, then there may just be a software-based firewall on the target or maybe nothing at all. If at all possible, move closer to the target. The assigned host names that an organization uses can reveal a lot of information about their internal operations. Most large organizations have a standard host naming convention that is used to quickly identify a system. They may use characters in specific positions that indicate the operating system, architecture, purpose, and physical location. They may even throw in an application name as well. Figuring out the naming scheme makes finding important systems easier. Finding out if a system is still on the network often just required the ping command to check. It sent an ICMP echo request to the target system and waited for an echo reply. A system that replied was connected to the network, and that is enough to know there's a working system associated with the IP address. Using ping doesn't always work when it's been disabled or blocked, so we may have to try other methods. Sometimes we have to get creative to find systems. This may require us to look for available services from systems in order to find them. We may not be able to ping them, but we know they exist because they offer services to which we can connect. We can also examine packet captures and discover systems based on their network traffic. Once we've identified the systems available, we need to know more about what they do. Our next objective is to determine the purpose of each system that we've discovered. We can do this by finding what services these systems offer and use. Services are the methods by which the system communicates and exchanges data with other systems on the network. In the standard client-server model, we have a server, which can accept input, execute a process, and generate output. We also have a client, which connects to the server to exchange data or pass commands. The server is often described as a provider of a service while the client is a consumer. In a single unicast transaction, there is a server providing data and a client consuming that data. There are some obvious examples here. File shares, printer sharing, web servers, FTP, SSH, streaming audio and video services, and many others. Unfortunately, the term server is generic and is applied to hardware as well. For our discussion here, a server is a software component. There are a couple ways in which we can identify the services provided by a system. For most services, there is a standard network port number, which is a number that is used to identify the service. There is a list of common services and the port numbers that they use. When a client needs to use a specific service, it uses that service's known port number. By knowing what port numbers are open on a system, we can identify the individual services available on that system. We will refer to these as statically assigned and standard port numbers and describe them in more detail next. While we have standard port numbers for most services, there are times when conflicts arise over the use of the same port number by multiple services. In these cases, the server software can either request an available port number or deterministically pick an available port number and register it. These types of port assignments are dynamic and are typically a function of remote procedure call systems. There are times when the system administrator or even the user of a system may choose to use a non-standard port number. They may do this to hide the presence of the service or to bypass a security control. For example, web servers use a privilege port number that requires admin level access to start the server process to listen on that port. A normal user can change the web server configuration to a higher port number that does not require any special privileges. We may have to identify these services by the informational banner they display when we connect to the service or by the behavior they exhibit when we interact with them. 
Let's talk more about port numbers. If you're familiar with TCP IP networking, then this should be considered a refresher. There are a finite yet large amount of network port numbers available on each system. In TCP IP networking, the network port number is represented as a 16-bit integer for 2 to the 16th or 65,536 ports. Port number 0 is reserved, so there are only 65,535 available ports. Servers are typically always available on the network in order to provide data to clients at any time. The software that runs the server creates a listening network socket on a network port, identified by a number. The network port is a known identifier for a specific service. For example, SSH uses port 22. FTP uses port 21 for control data. Email is transferred on ports 25 and 587. Web servers use port 80 unless it's encrypted with TLS and then port 443 is used. Standard network port numbers are officially managed and assigned by an organization known as the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, or IANA, which is a department in ICANN, or the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. Service name and network port number assignments are available from the IANA website and are distributed with operating systems. On Unix systems, they're listed in the Etsy services file. Some network services use seemingly random port numbers. These are typically part of a remote procedure call service, and each registers its port number to avoid conflicts with other services. So, how do clients know what port to use? They ask the port mapper, which maps the service to the port number it's currently using. On Unix systems, the port mapper runs on a well-known port of 111. On Windows, it's port 135. We can also query the port mappers to identify RPC services on a target system. When we are scanning for services on a single machine, or even across a large network, there are potentially a large number of ports to check. We can take advantage of some specific strategies to shorten the search time. There are a lot of variables that impact the speed at which you get results from a scan, such as a network with a lot of latency, overloaded network links, or busy endpoints. Also, each system has a large number of potential network ports that can be open, and there are a large number of systems on the network. Multiply those numbers out, and you'll have a lot of scanning to do. Our goal here is to get the results we need without spending a lot of time waiting for scans to complete. Consider that a system with 65,535 potentially open network ports requires a minimum of 65,535 packets to be sent to scan. If there's an open port, then additional packets will need to be sent. How you configure the scanner can impact how quickly you can scan. Instead of searching every port, we can configure the scanner to only scan the most common ports in use. InMap maintains a list of services and their frequency of use. By default, InMap will search the 1,000 most common ports. That list can be further restricted to 100 ports or an arbitrary number of the most common ports with additional options. You can also specify ports by ratio of frequency of use. All of these capabilities limit the number of ports searched, reducing the number of packets sent, which shortens the search time. Instead of looking by frequency of use, you can be very specific and only look at specific services. You might be interested in only finding web services since you have a good toolkit for exploiting web application vulnerabilities. In addition to limiting service searches, you can tune the way the scanner works to get better performance. InMap and other scanners can be tuned to run extremely fast, or you may want to have it run slowly at certain times. You can also change the number of hosts that are scanned simultaneously. You may also want to employ multiple scanners. Hardware techniques can also be employed. I hope it's obvious, but having a faster and bigger pipe almost always helps. Your ability to shove packets down your connection and get them back quickly is key. Be mindful of asymmetric network services where your upload speed is capped at a low level. If you're running your scanner from a VM, that can also limit your scan speed. The overhead of the host operating system plus the overhead of the guest operating system adds up. Having a dedicated hardware scanner can shorten your search time too. Once we've discovered hosts on their network and their services, we need to know more about those systems and services. Here we are interested in unique characteristics each system possesses. The first characteristic I always like to know is the operating system. What is it? Is it a Unix system, Windows, or something else? We also want to know what version of the operating system. Is it something very old and likely unpatched, or something more recent? 
InMap uses TCP stack fingerprinting to determine the operating system type and version of the target system. It does this by sending a series of packets and examining their responses. Using a database of more than 2,600 known systems, it can accurately determine the operating system and version of the target in most cases. The type of service is helpful. Is it a web server or file service? Also, knowing the version of a service helps determine if it has known vulnerabilities for that version. Both InMap and the Metasploit framework are useful here. InMap has the ability to detect services and their versions. It also has a rich scripting framework and includes scripts which can be used to gather additional data about the target services. The Metasploit framework has some very specific scans that target services and gather version information. Sometimes, just having a list of characteristics of a system, we can discover how best to exploit it to gain access. If it's an older system, it may not be updated or patched, which means there could be a treasure trove of vulnerabilities waiting to be used. Vulnerabilities are weaknesses in a system. They can be configuration problems, fundamental programming errors, design problems, or significant system architecture issues. One system could have one vulnerability or a hundred. Some of the vulnerabilities can be easy to exploit. Others may require the exploitation of a series of vulnerabilities in order to attack the system. Vulnerabilities may yield complete access to the system, denial of service, or even the ability to read a few bits of memory. Collectively, vulnerabilities represent multiple paths of entry into a system, each with its own level of difficulty to exploit. Using software version numbers is one simple way to find vulnerabilities. In identifying characteristics of each system, we gathered information about the operating system version and versions of the services running. Software vendors tend to fix their vulnerabilities and other problems with the release of new versions of the software. If we find older version numbers of software that are known to have vulnerabilities, then we may have found the vulnerabilities we need. This is not always going to work. In the open source world, patched versions of software packages that fix vulnerabilities are often distributed. Vendors like Red Hat tend to apply patch software to correct the vulnerabilities without altering the software version number. The difference between patched and unpatched versions are recorded in the software package version, but it isn't easy to see that from the network side. Actively probing a system for vulnerabilities is one way to address this problem. We do this by querying the system to determine if it has the vulnerability without exploiting the problem in a malicious way. A simple analogy would be if I ask the system what the result of adding 1 plus 2 together would be, and the system tells me the answer is 4, then I know that the vulnerability exists. There are several network vulnerability scanners that can be used to actively probe systems. We already configured OpenVAS for our use. There are others as well. The information security industry adopted a way of uniquely identifying specific vulnerabilities called the Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures, or CVE. These identifiers are helpful in that they can be used to find usable exploits by the CVE identifier. Soon we'll be scanning some targets in our demonstrations. I encourage you to scan your own targets as well for practice and learning. Just remember that you should only be scanning systems that you own and operate or that you have explicit permission to scan. If you need permission, make sure it's in writing. My wife was nice enough to put little hearts on mine.